Last but not least, we want to introduce you to some high throughput techniques that are used to study the metabolism in big cohorts or to compare many different factors such as mutations, protein expression or metabolites within different study groups. Welcome to the world of omics. In the last 20 years, a couple of experimental techniques ending with omics have become quite popular in research. We have genomics, proteomics, metabolomics and so forth. But what does that mean? Genomics, for example, look at all genes of an organism. The Human Genome Project was one of the biggest collaborative projects between many labs worldwide. This project lasts 13 years from 1990 until 2003 and aimed to sequence the complete human DNA. It involved 20 separate universities and research centers across the world and cost over $1 billion. Since then, we have come quite far in 2022, the world record for a sequencing the whole genome of a person was set in one lab of Stanford Medical University in only five hours and two minutes. You can see experimental technology in recent years has advanced so much that we are now able to measure the expression of all genes in a cell or a tissue at a given time point in very little time. This is called transcriptomics, for example. If a researcher is interested in which proteins are made at a certain time or with a particular treatment, we call it proteomics. Metabolomics is the measurement of all metabolites in a cell. Based on this principle, you probably could easily answer this quiz about the other omic techniques. With the development of high throughput sequencing, the DNA of many individuals could be sequenced. This huge amount of data allows us to compare different groups of people with each other and, for example, search for mutations that are frequently associated with the metabolic syndrome. As we mentioned, metabolic syndrome is a multifactorial disease and therefore also many different genes might be affected. These so-called genome-wide association studies, or in short, GBAS, compare genetic variants across the genomes of many individuals to identify genotype-phenotype associations. For example, lean people are compared with obese ones for mutations that are more often found in one group than in the other. Often, mutations in genes are found through these studies that do not disrupt them, but alter the activity of a protein or change an interaction site with another protein. We speak here of single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. This is when only one nucleotide of the DNA is exchanged. For example, if you look at the DNA sequence of a person, person 1 has an A, person 2 has a T, and person 3 has a G. The next step is to look whether these exchanges correlate with a certain phenotype, let's say high blood sugar. This can help us to find loci that are often more associated with a disease like type 2 diabetes. Ah, uh, yes. Let me explain this to you. It looks somewhat like this. On one axis, you have all the gene variants that are measured by the scientists. On the other axis, the likelihood for high blood sugar levels. There are some lines that stick out, and voila, there you have some variants that are found more often when blood sugar is high in the person. Hmm, but how could getting that information be of any help? This is a great question, Asu, and thanks for explaining, Asa. These studies could be used to inform someone of the individual risk for developing a disease. Let's say you have many of those risk factors in, for high blood sugar in your genes. That could mean that you develop it more likely than a person that does not have this increased genetic disposition. GWAS studies are also used by the pharmaceutical industry to identify targets for developing a specific drug. In this context, you might have heard of personalized medicine, which is becoming more and more common nowadays. 
While there is a great potential in these high throughput studies, there are also quite some difficulties associated with them. One thing that we want you to keep in mind is that often these are simply associations. That doesn't necessarily mean that there is also a causal connection and maybe no direct biological relevance to disease. Also, as we mentioned already above, many factors like age, sex, ethnicity, and so on have to be considered. Thus, the interpretation of such human data can be really complicated. This is why researchers often turn to animal models to study parts of the disease, because they can better control the circumstances by which the experiments are set up. For example, animals receive a controlled diet and scientists can study how certain nutrients like lipids or sugars influence the metabolism. Also researchers have the chance to manipulate a single gene and look how this affects the whole organism. Even though animal studies are considered controversial, they have contributed a great deal to the understanding of the metabolic syndrome. Coming back to that example with high blood sugar, even though your genetic disposition puts you more at risk for developing diseases like diabetes, that doesn't mean that you will develop it. A healthy lifestyle or other circumstances might prevent it. This maybe gives you a bit of sense that when studying metabolic syndrome, a combination of many experimental techniques is still very important. Summing up, in this video we introduced you to what type of high throughput studies are often used for studying the metabolic syndrome, such as different omics techniques and genome-wide association studies. Furthermore, we pointed out that in order to understand this multifactorial disease, a combination of several experimental techniques is needed. In the upcoming units, we will give you a more in-depth insight to nutritional components that affect the metabolic syndrome. And further, we will also talk about the effects that this syndrome has on our metabolic organs.